many years ago, one of my meditation teachers said, healing is to touch with love that which has been previously touched by fear. And that really lit something up of like, that makes so much sense. I What I'm up to in this world, whether it is through public policy and social justice organizing or just how I treat myself or others, what I really want to put into the world is love. Hello and welcome. I'm Abby. This is Stories Lived, Stories Told, and today I invite you to join me in conversation with Hedy Nam and Lashonda Sugg as we take a communication perspective on personal freedom and collective liberation. To take a communication perspective is to consider what we're making and how we're making it through our communication practices. This means we look closely at patterns, context, stories, and relationships, and that we use curiosity, mindfulness, collaboration, and dialogue to create better social worlds. So whether the topic of today's conversation is familiar to you or not, the hope is that using a communication perspective will reveal new ways of seeing and being for all of us. At the top of the episode, you heard one of our conversation partners today, Hedy Nam. I met Hedy earlier this year at the Omega Women's Leadership Center's virtual course, Do Power Differently, and I'm so glad I did. Hedy is the founder of Rosalie Consulting and the co-host of the Labors of Love podcast, along with Shonda, our other conversation partner today, who, in addition to co-hosting the Labors of Love podcast with Hedy, is a therapist, trainer, and coach. I had the opportunity to be on their podcast back in August of this year, and it was so fun to be a guest. So I hope you'll feel inspired to check that out too after listening to our conversation here. This is the first episode of our healing series, and it's a perfect way to start off. A central question for me this month has been, what can we better understand about healing by using a communication perspective? You'll hear us begin to explore this today, and I just think both Hetty and Shonda offer such great insight from their own lives and experiences, and they're very generous in sharing their stories. Before we jump in, I do want to ask for your help with one thing. I'm beginning to think about the next season of the podcast, and if you've been listening for some time now, you will have noticed that my approach and format has changed over the past couple of years, and that's because each year... I'm reflecting and learning and making new choices about what works and what's meaningful. And that is something that I want your help to figure out. So I'd love to invite you to fill out the survey that I've linked in the show notes so that you can help me to co-create this podcast to be what you want it to be. I want to know how you use the podcast, what you're looking for, what you want to know and hear on this space. Again, you can find that link in the show notes. I really appreciate it if you would participate, but for now, let's begin this conversation with Hetty and Shonda. Hi, Hetty and Shonda. Thanks so much for joining me for this conversation today. I've really been looking forward to speaking to you both again. Hi, Abby. It's great to be on and with Shonda. Yes, yeah, so good to be here. Good. I'm glad that both of you are excited about this as well. Ever since we recorded on your podcast, Labors of Love, which both of you co-host, I've been especially excited to get to be in conversation again with both of you. Before I get ahead of myself, though, I always like to have my conversation partners introduce themselves. I try to be really intentional about that instead of me trying to read some one-liner about you. I'd love to have you introduce yourselves. You tell us who you are. What are the stories that you're telling about yourself? And what do you want us to know, specifically in the context of this conversation? Both of you and I have had some conversation about what we want to talk about today. So maybe that's a good context. What's relevant for us to know about you? Since we can't hope to learn everything about you in the next couple of minutes, where do you want us to start? And maybe Shonda, you would start off for us. Yeah. So I'm LaShonda Sugg. Go by Shonda. I use she, her pronouns. And, you know... Who am I is, is a deep question that mm-hmm. I think could easily be answered with a lot of words. And as I, I sit in reflection daily of like, hmm, this is a very emergent question. I, I feel the most accurate 
language I can give for it right now is I'm a reflector. Um, I navigate the world as a mirror, knowing that when I interact with people, they have the opportunity to see themselves as they actually are, not necessarily based on the lens of who they've been told they are or even who they want to be, but just kind of what is that right now reflection. And I also uh, recognize I'm a soul hugger. I'm a physical hugger. I have been for as long as I can remember. Uh, And then COVID hit and I started seeing people virtually one-on-one. And my typical question at that time at the end of a session would be, so how are you leaving our time together today? And I started to get a recurrent response of like, oh, it feels just like I got a hug. Mm -hmm. And it started to make me think like, oh, I don't have to physically embrace someone to hug them. I'm hugging their souls. And so, yeah, soul hugger and reflector, feel the most accurate right now and how I am navigating the world um, in what might be considered practical terms and words that people more readily understand. I, I, I function in that capacity as a therapist and a liberatory coach, trainer, and consultant. And what is important to know? I mean, literally, I ask that question every day. So I would say for the context of this conversation, I've really just been sitting with the notion of personal freedom and collective liberation and and what what that means, what it costs. Um, and the more I, I literally text this to Hetty a few hours ago, and it's like the more free I become the more intolerant of bondage I grow. Mm. And that makes navigating this world really challenging because we are a bound culture, society, and world. Um, So yeah, I feel like that that's how I'm showing up in this moment today. Mm. Yeah, that's a great start. Thanks for that. And I already am thinking a million things, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. So Hetty, can you introduce yourself? Yes, thank you for these wonderful questions, Abby, and it just feels so good to have Shonda share herself and set the stage for our conversation. I agree with you, Abby, so many juicy things there. So hi, everyone. My name is Hedy Nam. Um, I am living on occupied Tongva land, which is um, also otherwise known as Los Angeles, California. And I originally hail from Seoul, South Korea, which is where I was born. And then I moved to the New York City area when I was almost eight with my mom and my younger brother. Um, And so I think one of the first places where we learn relationship and like kind of do world building is our relationship to land and place. Um, And when I go into rural areas, clearly I've lived in like three huge global cosmopolitan cities, Seoul, New York City, and now Los Angeles. Um, I'm learning, I learn constantly more about myself and the world and what I think is quote unquote normal and how I'm supposed to relate to things. So my relationship to place is very important. Um, And the fact that I'm a child immigrant um, that's grown up in the U.S. Um, I am married. Uh, I'm a cis queer woman with hetero privilege because I present as hetero, um, married to a cis male, um, a hetero man. And um, I'm a rescue dog mom. And so that is really important to me of going beyond um, anthropocentrism, which basically is um, a supremacy of human beings. I I learned so much from my dog and animals and plants and even quote unquote um, non-sentient beings such as the rocks and the dirt that has held place all around us. Um, and I'm a domestic violence survivor and elder child of a single immigrant mom, um, and I have a like a complicated family setup of um one of my dearest the dearest people in my life is 
my older sister, who's my half sister from um, my dad's first marriage. And my dad's been in and out of my life. And I mention all of this because I think now we've moved into a social world where talking about a regular family structure is a normal thing. But I know when I was a kid in the 80s, it was like, who's your mom and dad? And um, it was very complex to talk about. So I think in terms of the world being bonded, I would say, um, as Shonda said, there's been so much in my early childhood and upbringing and early life experiences that have led me to crave uh, freedom and a personal freedom and collective liberation, as Shonda would say. And I think we're going to get into later in this conversation about how we use words to um, kind of undo those bonds and how words don't just describe the world, but wor words can world the world or create the world. I will stop there and pass it back. That's such a great place to start. I. I'm not surprised to hear your introductions because a lot of people that I talk to and I say, introduce yourself, who are you start with their relationships. And I think that makes a lot of sense, you know, social related creatures to each other. Those relationships to me at least are so important. So it makes sense that that's how we define ourselves. And I appreciate the layer that you are both adding of first heady, this relationship to not only other humans, but other beings and other things in our world. And what's our relationship there? And then also normalizing all these different kinds of relationships and Shonda talking about the content of the relationship that maybe that changes over time and situationally, like maybe in your relationships, you're a physical hugger, but when you can't be, how do you become a soul hugger? So I really appreciate this kind of place that we're starting of relationships and relationships from a really expansive place, because I think both of your work and personal interest and passion for liberation is innately very relational. So I think that's a really wonderful place for us to start anyway. Continuing down the relationship train, I'd love to know more about the work that you two do together. So maybe you can each speak a little more to how you first crossed paths and what your relationship looks like and means to you. Yeah. You want me to take it, Hetty? Start? Go for it. Okay. Um, so, well, Hetty and I first entered consciously each other's orbit through a coaching program that we both went through coaching for healing justice and liberation and uh, we were part of a cohort of there were 36 of us mm -hmm. and so it was something about coming into a space where healing justice and liberation were the foundational like link between this very diverse group of people diversity across all spectrums of the identities that are boxes you can check in our society. There was a large, diverse demographic of people. But what became really obvious really quickly is this depth that we entered in because of that, you know, to the point that, you know, I could tell you some of my cohort members' deepest fears, but I could not tell you what they did for a day job. Or mm -hmm, what yeah. city they lived in across the United States, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, and it was something so unfortunately rare and beautiful to enter a space at a, at a depth level that didn't require all the small talk and, you know, superficial things that we usually have to ease into in order to get some of that, those um, deeper things. And so in in some way, I also have a very complicated relationship with biological family. There was something about entering this space and recognizing that while I've had chosen family my whole life, and I've had unchosen family, it was something <laughs> about coming in and having a choice to choose these people and know that I was being chosen. It was really beautiful. And so we spent a lot of time as siblings of the cohort, Right. Um, which had a lot of depth, but it didn't have a lot of like personal connection. We didn't talk on the phone or really send each other texts and things. Um, and I, by that point, I think I had been doing the Labors of Love podcast for a few years. And it was my hope, like, y'all 36 people plus four, like, 
Mm-hmm. I want all of y'all to be a guest on the podcast. Like there's so much richness. And so uh, there was like this open invitation. Um, and at some point, Hetty accepted that invitation and she was a guest on the podcast. And um, we had the podcast. And afterwards, um, I was speaking to my producer, who also doubles as my partner, husband, father of my children, love of my life, all that good stuff. And it was like, we finished recording, we got off Zoom and we were both like, mm, I don't know, like, we need some more of that. Like, we, I don't know, like, it's, what, what, I mean, by that point, I, 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 do you remember what episode you were? I think it was like 140 or something okay. and we're at so 190. Like, we, I have been at this for a while and mm-hmm. I had never I mean, I had invited people to come back, open invitation, but it was something like, I, and we couldn't put our finger on it. And mm. so it, it it turned into me going, you know what? I've never been a guest on the Labors of Love podcast. And it started with me being like, I feel like Hetty could, could be the host and interview mm, me mm. on this podcast. I I would like to answer the question and be guided by someone. What's your labor of love kind of thing? And as we continue to go, I had never considered, just never considered a co-host. You know, I, I can recognize that solo lifting, solo existing, solo burden carrying was just kind of the frame that I had to survive. Uh, whether it was through trust and all the things, but I was like, Jay, I don't know. I, I, it, I feel like Kitty could, Kitty could be a co-host, and he was like, you know, we we're really vibing with that, and so mm-hmm. we extended the invitation, um, and Hetty accepted, and the rest is present. <laughs> it's not even mm-hmm. history. It's just mm-hmm. yeah, how yeah. to be able to recognize that um, there are some foundational core values and ways of being in the world that feel very aligned and yet we are very different people Mm -hmm. and we she added this um dimension to the podcast and my life that was so welcomed like you want a factual detail you're not gonna get it from me you (laughs) want like historical context (laughs) I'm just not going to give it to you. Like, and it's not withholding. It's just mm-hmm. Not mm-hmm. how I navigate the world. And so Hetty came in and she just added this depth, not just to the podcast, but to my life of like, mm-hmm. oh, the things that are the caveats I don't have to make to have a conversation with her is mm-hmm. so refreshing. And and so, yeah, we con- we connected in that way. And then we just realized that not only was the routine of like weekly recording something that we looked forward to, but we just, we value each other in one Mm. another's lives and our families. Mm -hmm. I love her partner and husband, TJ, and I know she loves my family and my kids. And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, it just became this relational bond through which we would have amazing conversations and record them and let people listen to them. Yeah. I love that. And it's so fun whenever you ask a couple, like, how did you meet? How did you get together? It's like, just seeing all of the details, like everything Shonda said, 1000% cosign. And I'm gonna lift up like, it was funny, because during the cohort of the coaching program, Shonda is, is just always Shonda. So she was always dropping gems in our discussions. And I was like, this is a really cool person. And I'm so glad that I have like, I felt so blessed just to be in her presence, but never really thought that we would become friends because I was like, oh, she, I've told her this already, but she was like kind of a mini celebrity status in my mind of like, <laughs> oh, like she and I can't become friends. And then I went on the podcast, had an amazing time, but then she and I would um, go on Zoom calls with our cohort um, uh, led by this wonderful woman named Krista Robinson, who was uh, who would just throw a Zoom on and be like, there's no topic. This is just a party Zoom. And we were talking and after something I said, Shonda was like, 
Listening to Hetty run her mouth, you know what? I never thought about this, but maybe I need a, a co-host for the <laughs> podcast. And that's all she said. And it's like that thing when you're younger of like, um, you're like, I like them. Do they like me too? So yes. I'm just like, I'm assuming she's looking for a co-host and something I said sparked that in her, never imagining that mm -hmm. it was me. And then I went to Ohio where Shonda lives because my parents-in-law lived really far from Shonda, but we met halfway in the middle in Columbus and shared an amazing Korean meal at which she asked me formally in person, like, Jay and I would love to have you as a podcast host. And I was like, who, me? Did you dial the wrong number? <laughs> like, <laughs> and I said, of course. So we've just been on this journey since then. And it's exactly like she says, it's not something we turn on and off for work. Like mm -hmm. if that's truly a labor of love, like none of us are getting paid. And um, I think this gets to sort of your question on this podcast of how do you build better social worlds? Often we think that conversation and knowledge can just be easily exchanged mm -hmm. when in fact, it's the container. And so what Shonda said makes me feel so good that she doesn't have to drop any caveats uh, in just saying, and if I have questions and I don't understand, I'll be like, hey, what does this mean? But she doesn't have to do a bunch of like disclaimers for fear of being misunderstood or maligned by me. And I think that the more we can do that, the more we're going to really get to know each other um, and generate some like really cool stuff of like Shonda's part of my journey of me saying, you know what, um, I'm not really like wedded to the story that I have to be a nice person because I'm a woman. You know, I may be the villain in some people's story. Now I get up every day and try to be kind and loving. Mm -hmm. But when I say no to something that someone may really want that I do not have within my resources to give to them, I may be the mean person that said no. And I'm like, I'm okay with that. And that's an example of the bonds that I'm freeing of myself, not to be an asshole, but to really like, be free in our love and set no limits. And I'm like, I can't wait to see where our friendship goes and where the podcast goes because there's no limit. It's whatever our wildest dreams are made of. And I don't think I can say that about, I can count on one hand the number of relationships like that that I have. And Shonda's one of them. Yeah, that this is a little bit of a tangent, but you just made me think of it. And it, it just points to this bigger thing about what are the stories we tell ourselves and what you already said that is so fundamental to everything. I believe that it is our communication has this creative force in it to make real change. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this game called We're Not Really Strangers card game. You both would mm -hmm. love it. So wonderful. Just good conversation starters with people in it, you know, kind of gamifies it, but it's also kind of moving you through these phases of getting to know each other, understanding each other, and then kind of reflecting on that. And I was playing with a group of people and the question came up, someone else was asking about me or I was asking someone else about myself, I think. And it was, am I nice? Or do you think I of me as nice or something about me? Am I nice? And I've even been in friend groups where I've jokingly been referred to as the nice one. And so I'm, I'm rolling my eyes being like, yeah, that's my thing. I'm nice. And then this person was like, not really. And I was so surprised. But then the more they explained, they're like, I'm not saying you're mean, but that's not like the first thing I think about with you. And I was so taken aback by that. And I felt, I actually feel like that's a compliment and is, I, you know, again, not to say I don't want to be kind in the world, but there's so many other things that I want to be described as and so many other ways I want to show up to let other people feel like they can also show up in that way. And so it's so funny to hear you say, you know, even that kind of specific language. And it is the crazy power of stories that are, you know, we get to make our own stories and make them real. So circling back to, you know, the two of your relationship with seems like a really special space that you two have created through your communication, through your relating with each other. You've created this space 
that allows you to be and show up as yourselves. And so I'm curious to know more about what you feel like you've created together in your relationship mm. and what what's, what's the story you're kind of creating together in your personal relationship or in your work relationship? Or I know they, you know, overlap. Maybe that's not even an either or question, but both. Mm. Well, I'm going to answer that. But when you were talking about nice, it made me think about, so Jay, my partner and husband, um, we have this thing where he goes, oh, I'm way nicer than you, but you're way friendlier than I am. Mm. And like, we have this delineation, yeah. right? And I I understand like the socialization of nice. For me, right. it was inundating due to multiple intersecting identities that I have, that being, mm -hmm. you know, being female at birth and socialized as a woman. Um, being a fat black woman, there's this mammy trope mm -hmm. um, and stereotype that has followed me throughout my whole life of, you know, emotionally wet nursing people and mm -hmm. abandoning all the things. And so the interesting thing about nice is when I let it go, it was like a shackle I didn't even know mm -hmm. that was binding me. And that's mainly because nice for me, again, this is how I view it through my lens and the story I tell myself about nice is nice is for the benefit of others mm -hmm. and an essence of love and kindness is for the benefit of all. Like I am included in the process of, of, of flowing in love and being kind and nice is for somebody else. And so having to be nice meant I was always outwardly focused on trying to manipulate someone else's response or reaction to how I was showing up yeah so nice was the other side of the coin of intimidation both were an attempt to elicit mm. a response or a reaction um even if that was to feel safe so right not vil vilifying that but yes yeah, so as, as, as that part of the discussion was coming up mm. you know I I actually hope that people like nice is not in a descriptor that anyone has yeah. because then it lets me know that I've slipped back into um uh, a form of people pleasing mm -hmm. that I I've, I've I've diligently worked to release myself from mm -hmm. and I talked myself out of the question um so you tell me again Abby <laughs> no uh, no because I was ready to like <laughs> like yes I have an answer for that um I remember what are we creating together but there was something before that no, I'm really glad that you went back to that that nice thing too, because it's yeah, I think it is telling like we all have our own stories around that, and it's that's to me, I'll share you know that is part of the story for me is shedding those um, kind of labels or ways of being that are actually really really limiting, and so that you know it does transition me into the question I asked, which I'll say again because to me it's the the new meaning we create, the new stories we tell when we relate to each other in the way that it seems that the two of you relate to each other, where you're just giving each other the space. I want to know in your own words, what does it feel like you're creating through your communication, through your ways of being with each other, through your relating to each other? What's mm. the story? What's the meaning? What is the social world you're creating in your relationship together? That, that is so meaningful to both of you from what I can see. Yeah, thank you. Well, the first thing that came to my mind is I think we are creating a playground and mm -hmm. a practice ground. Mm -hmm. And there is, I think, a general acceptable reality that if someone wants to improve with something, then practice is a part of improvement. You know, while maybe there's some disagreement, that feels pretty universally accepted across many things, whether it's music, athletic, you know, like, oh, we got to practice. But relationally, people forget that, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll think a concept. I want to be more loving. I want to be more kind. I want to set boundaries. I want to want to do all these things. But then so few people recognize that we have to practice those things too. That's such a great and point. Yeah. And so what we've created in some ways is a very open practice field where we get to say things like, hey, 
one of our primary modes of communication is WhatsApp. When I send you a WhatsApp, it's because I am sending you when I have the time, space, capacity, and thought. And you get to practice responding when you get to it. And I get to practice not making up a story about why it's taking you the time it's taking you to practice and delving down into what is she thinking? Did I say the wrong thing? So we we practice going like we get to operate in our boundaries, right? That's practice. I value that so much. And I and I we're creating a playground because I don't have to have a well thought out, concise thought mm-hmm. to send a voice message to Hetty mm-hmm. all over mm-hmm. the place and be like, yep, that was a lot of words. Uh take yep hear back from you when I hear back from you you know Mm -hmm. I get to play with thoughts I get to play with ideas I get to play with new concepts I get to send pictures of photos I'm taking or art that I'm making and 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 it's it's a place you know where we're creating the families we always deserved Mm -hmm. and get right Mm -hmm. Um, so that our littles, which is what I call our inner children and our historical parts and other parts get to kind of play around with the freedom, the love, the acknowledgement, acceptance, and understanding that they were worthy of, I was worthy of, Hetty was worthy of, but we, Mm -hmm. we didn't receive it. And it, it's something that feels, um, like just phenomenal, phenomenally, oh, I don't even know the words, like. I don't know what the most priceless gem is in the world that someone can quantify and say, this is what it costs, but whatever that is, this is more precious to me. Mm -hmm. Um, Because as I practice with Hetty, I can take some of these things into my other relationships that may not necessarily be as safe to practice. Like maybe that relationship has a nice little swing, but that's it. You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so I get to kind of practice this thing here and then I translate that into other relationships. And the thing about it is I'm building really effective, strong relational muscles in my relationship with Hetty. Mm -hmm. And so when Mm -hmm. I move into other relationships, I feel strong. I feel equipped. I feel confident that there are places where my boundaries matter. My yes and no means something that I don't have to filter myself. A big one for me that I'm not too much, Mm -hmm. right? That I'm not going to just drown people by existing. Mm -hmm. And every other relationship is not that, but when it's not, it helps me to create the story that it's not as much about me and deficits that I have, but there may not just be the capacity Mm -hmm. in this relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't have to give up knowing that it's possible because I have this relationship that can come Mm -hmm. back to. Um, And so I would say that feels like what we're building. Oh man. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And I think um, it, for me, feels like an outdated version of friendship where, um, uh, one of the things that Shonda and I share is uh, we're both two on the Enneagram spectrum helpers. And Me we've too. had our battles with um, ups and downs with people pleasing, you yeah. know, out of love and kindness and also out of fear. And so when I was young, um, coming into age like preteen teens I actually had a rotating cast of best friends um every year of school because to me a best friend was um oh I'm so lucky that someone even wants to be friends with me I have to do everything that they want and then it was there there was no boundaries and when it got to a place and it didn't have to be something like hurtful but just like I don't want to do that activity as much if I didn't want to do it that friend what I did was I trained that person not to be invested in what it is Mm. that I felt like doing or what I wanted to do so then going into adulthood uh, I would watch like you know clips of 
friend's sitcom on TV that was really popular in like the 90s and stuff and be like, oh, I can't trust people who are just like best friends like that because I had a really messed up idea of what it was to be best friends. And now with Shonda, it's like, it's just, we have a fundamental disposition for each other that is unmovable of unconditional love regardless of if our needs and wants per- happen to align at the particular second, like same part of each day. And not only are we going to be understanding of like when I get to a message late on WhatsApp, maybe Shonda is practicing not making up a story about why I didn't respond, but I'm practicing not feeling guilty that I didn't get to get to it before. And not only are we practicing, we're actually talking about practicing. Mm -hmm. So um, when she says like, oh, this is what comes up for me when we're communicating. And I'm like, oh my God, I have a little part that's like, I don't want to hurt Shonda. So I can never say no to her. And then I'm not asking Shonda to take care of that little girl. I'm just naming Mm -hmm. it so you know what's going on behind the scenes, but I'm taking care of her and be like, no, no, Shonda can get, she's allowed to get annoyed or feel impatient or frustrated at me, but she does not, she's not going to banish you out of her life. (laughs) I mean, at the way, the trajectory this is going, maybe if we do a hard turn to something else, but the way that this is flowing Mm -hmm. She will tell you honestly, hey, Hetty, like that hurt my feelings or I'm annoyed or she'll and she'll really bring it to me after she's done her own emotional work. So I think that's pretty radical because a lot of like therapy and like, what do I do in this relationship with my boss, with my friend, with my mom? A lot of it is like coaching the person to be covert behind the scenes, Mm -hmm. how to like present themselves in a way that's going to get the reaction that they want and I'm like what if we let go of all that and I don't know that it would work in every relationship but like Shonda said this one happens to be a playground and a testing ground for that and we're bringing that into the labors of love how we are normally we always say on like a private call like this could have been recorded there's nothing here that we're ashamed of so I think another story, what we're creating is a new way to have a public conversation where it doesn't all have to be neatly packaged up in conclusions and expertise, but that just like the story of how your life unfolds, the stories may feel different while you're living them yeah. than once they are take their rightful place in the past. And that doesn't mean the story as you're living them is wrong like that Mm -hmm. whole 2020 is hind like hindsight is 2020 i'm like what you see in hindsight is true and what you felt then is also true and can you let all of those stories exist at the same time yeah yeah that so beautiful and it's making me think about what in my world we would call meta communicating you know communicating about how you're communicating and i think that's such a powerful tool, but kind of like you're saying, there's not really the space for that in every single relationship. It is something that has to be practiced. But to me, that's the heart of so much of something that can lead to healing is when we can practice metacommunicating, which I think one great example is to think about meaning making and the way we make meaning differently. One of the conversations I've had previously on the podcast is with a therapist who specifically works with mixed neurotype couples. And we talked about, can you say the unsaid thing is kind of the language she used. And we talk about the meaning making that maybe in that relationship, the person with ADHD, they need to put their keys in the same spot every single day. And so if they can articulate and if the other person in the relationship can hear what that means to them, maybe they can both have a little more grace for each other. You can respect the person that needs to put their keys in the same spot. And then maybe also that person can respect that you might not put the keys in the same spot every day because you don't make the same meaning out of it. And so that's a, you know, unique situation, but I think it applies across the board. It's not just people with, you know, mixed neurotypes interacting. It is every single one of us is making different meaning and it doesn't Mm -hmm. have to be guesswork and Mm -hmm. you can have those conversations. That would be the meta communicating to show up to a moment and say, you know, it's what you're both already doing. 
Shonda, the meaning that I'm making of this moment is that it's really challenging for me not to feel a lot of guilt over not responding to you. Or Shonda saying, Hetty, the meaning that I'm making right now is that there's this layer for me of I'm telling a story of why you're not responding. And I'm really trying to work on that. That helps you have so much more compassion for each other, helps you to be more Mm -hmm. curious about each other. That feels so, so important. So it's really cool to see you practice that. And also to recognize that it's not as easy as, you know, just meta communicate because you also have to, and this is my work as also an Enneagram to get enough in touch with myself to know what things mean to me. And then to be able to articulate that and have the space for that as well. Healing, I think on a personal level, but also on a collective level requires that meta communication and us looking at each other with curiosity, with a desire to understand. And I know that that is what a lot of your work is about both of you in different ways. And then I've also come to know about both of you that your work is certainly not separate from your personal lives. And so I'm curious about, again, the meaning you're making, the stories you're telling around healing and how you find that for yourself and how you hope to help other people find that for themselves as well. Maybe you could talk about your individual pursuits of that, and then we could talk about how you do that together. Well, one thing I want to say about my healing journey, I think it, as a young person, it was very influenced by the medical model. Mm -hmm. And so I always thought healing was um, you like get hurt and then you like take medicine or put ointments on and somehow it becomes a hundred percent of what it was before or like at least close to it, you might have a scar, but it functions like the way it was before. And so I look back in my life and so many opportunities for personal healing and for me to play a role in my community's healing. And I never thought um, the word healing or the work of healing applied to me because Mm. of that medical model. Um, And Uh, Many years ago, one of my meditation teachers uh, said, healing is to touch with love that which has been previously touched by fear. Mm. And that really lit something up of like, that makes so much sense. I what I'm up to in this world, whether it is through public policy and social justice organizing, or just how I treat myself or others what I really want to put into the world is love. And so I don't, um, there's a lot of like healing has become its own industrial complex. And I think I heard Brene Brown say once like, or somebody say like, preach from your scars, don't preach from your wounds. Mm -hmm. And my question with some of the things that are still open for me, like, still after many years processing the impact of my childhood abuse on me. I'm like, what if I don't have scars? They're not quite wounds, but I wouldn't say that the healing process has completed and I'm not sure when I'll feel that. So I just really decided to jump in and be like, I think healing is really the love that we apply. And that's given me an entry point into my journey. But I want to stop there because I'm curious by Shonda's facial expression <laughs> what she has to say about that. This face does things. I didn't even know I was making one. I was like, yes. I'm like, um, she has something to say. <laughs> always, I feel like. But, um, you know, you bring up the medical model and I appreciate that. I think the face was probably like just considering like, that's true. I did not have um, many medical things. I went to annual checkups as a kid, you know, I didn't have a lot of injuries, Um, just some pretty typical things. Like I never broke a bone. I I didn't have braces. Like there, I think interactions with the medical world that I didn't have. Um, But there was something very intriguing about scrapes, bumps, bruises, like they healed. There was something innate about how the human flesh suit is constructed that healing is just a part of the flesh suit capability um, for most 
flesh suits, right? Asterisk for I know that there are conditions and disorders mm-hmm. and things that limit that in some way. Um, and I didn't think about healing growing up. I cannot say, oh, here's the long life journey that I took. Um, I just know that I operated from a principle that I feel like was implicitly and explicitly given to me, which is you made the bed, you lie in it. Mm. Where you are is a result of the decisions that you've made. And, you know, uh, an overtly Christian context of you don't question God. And so healing wasn't even a thing for me until I left a 12 year relationship four days before my 30th birthday. Um, and then started going to therapy and realized that I was healing from things I didn't even know I was sick from. Mm. Like there was just something about like, wait a minute, I'm here because I'm separated, probably going to get a divorce. And I don't even know what that means. And that is where the whole world opened up for me to realize that that really good childhood that I would have and have said I had was the source of so many beliefs, worldviews, and behavioral patterns that I never knew I could question. And so but I was healing and I didn't even know what that meant. But what I did know is that once I knew it was possible, I wanted everyone to know it was possible. Yeah. Like, I I just feel like I want people to know that this thing is possible. Right. And if I scrape myself, even if I break skin and blood draws, I don't have to go get surgery. Right. I can put some ointment on it. I can, I can clean it. I'm going to put some ointment on it. Maybe I put a bandage to stop other debris from getting in it. But like in a relatively quick amount of time, my body knows how to heal itself. And so for me, it was like, what if I've been healing all along? I just didn't know it, Mm -hmm. right? What if I had open wounds and scrapes throughout life and I didn't know that and And I was healing all along. So for me, it was, let's go back and look at the scabs. This wound is still open. And, and, and that was my approach. And I think like in some ways that Hetty and I, there's overlap, right? Venn diagram-ish, but Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I see myself as the, the micro person. Mm -hmm. I see Hetty as the macro person. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I carried a lot of shame, around being the mac- the micro person because huh. on one hand you have like the therapeutic model and all this stuff that is super individualistic focus on you you got the self self help spectrum and all this stuff and so it's praised in one hand but this there was this realization that healing does not happen in isolation and how da 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 but yet i did not feel called drawn or even interested in some of the like more macro things, I'm I'm not a big thinker. And and I, you know, I felt for a really long time that I needed to be all things to all people. Mm. And so, and as a shapeshifter extraordinaire in yeah. a way that I think people would be uh, amazed, I can fit into any, any group. Mm-hmm. And, and like I belong there. Mm-hmm. Like I've always mm-hmm. been there. Mm-hmm. Um, I I was, I functioned as whoever I needed to be in a moment, in a group for this, the purpose of that. And as I started to come home to self, I I started to just be like, what, what if I am just who I am? And so healing for me is the capacity to be with another person, to just let them know that we have self-healing, regenerative, processes, Mm. capabilities. And sometimes we just need someone to witness us. We need someone Mm -hmm. to reflect us. We need. And so on one hand, I say micro, but why I know that work is inevitably macro is because I, when I am with one person, that person is going to go and be with 20 other people. Yep. And the impact that me being with them 
has on them is going to reverberate out in the world. So, you know, I think personal freedom and collective liberation are so important. And I also realize that just true to my essence and nature, I am the person who is going to sit with you as you explore and discover personal freedom. And I feel like as that starts to emerge, that's when our, you know, Venn diagram is connected. And then when people are like, now, what does this, how do I, how do I now go out? And I'm like, and now I'm going to turn you over to Hetty and those who work in the micro world, you know, and yeah. not turn over in that way. But, you know, if an organization is like, you know, we need to, we want liberated systems and we want to mm-hmm. decolonize our pot. And I'm just like, that is amazing. And I'm not your person. Mm-hmm. But when you inevitably start doing that work and realize you can't because each person you're trying to get to do that work hasn't dealt with their own shit. Yeah. I am the person you send them to, right? Mm-hmm. I'm the person who wants to journey with them to help them uncover all of those things. And what was the impact of my childhood? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. once they start to go like I am, I go, all right right? Now you can do that collective work because you have a group of people who can sit in the I am and now do a collective work, which is just hard to impossible when people haven't done that work. So I've referred to myself as a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. School, it's kind of like, yep, here's the track. You want to get this degree. And you're going to have to take these classes that are specific to that degree. But there are some prerequisites. Before you can take 401, you got to take 101. Mm -hmm. But even sometimes before that, you need to do an introduction. So I view myself as like the prerequisite, like that intro, soft entry. You're going to be loved on and you're going to be seen and all of those things to kind of help prepare to do some of what feels like the more advanced work. So that's kind of how I I see that. And I'm still developing a definition of healing. Mm-hmm. I don't have mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's just like, I know it. And my more recent discovery, which is so beautiful, because I, I have a... a I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and say like, I have a really nice mastery of words. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I learned that my words were my least effective way of being with people, it blew my mind because wow. I have relied on word. Our culture yeah. tells us that our words are the most important. But when I realized that my presence is actually more impactful, more depthful that I don't have to use where I can literally be with people. I have, I have said no words and people have been like, well, you might have to say it like that. And it's just like, I smile because I literally did not say (laughs) a word, like nothing. Or they'll be like, why are you looking at me like that? See, I know. And then they go on this whole thing and I'll just be like, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, sometimes words take away Mm-hmm. From what people need, because that requires me to do some figuring out and this and this. So when I surrendered the need to be the perfect therapist, to be the perfect coach, to be the perfect person, I I relied more heavily on my connection to spirit. And that's when I realized I'm truly a vessel. Mm-hmm. Things pass through. And that's how I can have such personal freedom. Because the things that I had before, which were, well, you got to do it right and you got to know what to say and you have to know what they're thinking. And I'm like, actually, I don't need to do any of that. Mm -hmm. I just need to show up. My presence Mm -hmm. is enough. And that feels radical in our culture where everyone is being told through some avenue, right? And I don't even use like the everyone, no one, but no, everyone somewhere is being told something based on who can capitalize off of their pain. Mm-hmm. Like, think about that. We're people sell healing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and water and air. Right. So I think it's just been helpful to go. My 
a large portion of my freedom has been achieved when I recognized that I am. Mm -hmm. And, And if that can be enough for me, then I don't have to buy the stories that tells me I need to purchase in order to be. Mm-hmm. I need okay. to lose weight in order to be. I need to do, I need to appear a certain way. I need to present a certain way. When my I amness became enough, so many shackles I feel like opened. But just because they open, you can still stay right where you are. Mm-hmm. I had to realize the shackles were open and I had to step out of them. And that kind of goes back to the relationship that Hetty and I have. Like, can we practice freedom together? Mm -hmm. Because it's not inherent. It's not an aid. We don't actually know what that is because we've been in bondage. So can we practice freedom together? And that feels like my, my corner of what I give to the world. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I just want to, pick up on what Shonda said about just being able to uh, the what healing is sold as and then where healing truly came from and being able to be in her body as she is and practice personal freedom and then the whole link to how that uh, um, adds up to collective liberation I think um for me, I went on the healing journey because I was dealing with some acute psychological pain that I didn't know was the result of childhood abuse and all of the like horrors that are completely normalized in our society about how mm-hmm. immigrants assimilate and just all of these things. Um, I just knew that I felt bad. And I benefited greatly from the medical and psychiatric therapeutic model. Um, And that was the beginning of my journey. But I'm 42 going on 43 now. I started therapy when I was 25. And I would say therapy has been life-saving. And I can say that I would literally not be here today if it was not for therapy. And the more I practice freedom, I'm like, the less the th- psychiatric model for understanding myself, the story that of how we equate, we don't know how to value our mental, emotional, spiritual well being. So we have to equate it mental health to physical health. Yeah. Because that's a framework that people can understand, but it doesn't actually work the same way. There's some similarities and connections but it's not. And then to think of how people feel and think and bodily sensations and how they act as, um, you know, symptoms of a disease, when in fact, ADHD, depression, anxiety, all of these things are perfectly normal. Like, it's your nervous system's reaction to things that are going on in the world. And so more and more people are being diagnosed with ADHD, more and more elderly are being diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's. And like, that makes a lot of sense because we are being, our attention is being pulled. So maybe you don't have some kind of um, like biological reason for having your attention spread, but the phenomenon of people feeling like they're procrastinating, they can't finish things, they don't know where things are. This is somewhat like normal for the way we've constructed society or the fact that we are outsourcing memory to our devices and the rise of those devices and GPS that's coming at the same time as greater um, you know, diagnoses of Alzheimer's dementia, not saying that that is the single variable, but just noticing what's in happening in society at the same time. And so I think part of the healing journey has been to relinquish this idea of I'm just doing it to feel better or to get back to some um, ability that I had before, which Mm -hmm. let's be honest, I was depressed as a child in an abusive home. So I don't even know what to go back to. (laughs) 
Mm. And just accepting like, hey, sometimes I feel depressed. Um, sometimes I feel anxious. Sometimes these, and I'm noticing this is happening in my partner or my friends or my colleagues. And before I go to, hey, let's heal this from a fix it approach, being like, let's heal like what's going on, maybe by being that soft landing pad myself of mm -hmm. creating that relationship and seeing where that goes and really trusting people and the amazing capacitive human beings to do their own self-healing as Shonda said I think the difference before my healing journey and now is I really wanted to help people but it was and it was not a conscious thought it was deeply subconscious it was needing to fix needing to make my world okay if somebody got angry or someone's upset or they didn't get what they needed there was a part of it it was like oh I feel insecure of like I don't know what's going on and so I need these things to happen and now it's just like this shit happens um I'm here here's what I can offer my presence and I don't necessarily have to offer you any solutions. I will if I have them, but I don't have to beat my brain <laughs> trying to rack my brain trying to do this. And often that has blossomed into some of the most healing that anyone has ever felt and gone on to do amazing things. And so, yeah, I think just to bring it back to what Shonda was saying of like, if someone's selling you something to get from where you are in pain to point B, not in pain, I think that we really need to question like what, what is really underlying their promises and their motivation versus somebody who's completely invested in your personal freedom and collective liberation, no matter who you are. And that spectrum of healing includes you're allowed to feel depressed or anxious on some days because there are a lot of things to be depressed and anxious about. And how can we help you manage and feel at your best? I'm so glad that you both bring up this point around presence, because when I talk about communication, I'm not just talking about words. Communication is so much more than that. And it is the way we're showing up to each other whether we're saying words or not, how we communicate, you know, every single thing we does, like, you know, Shonda was saying, I'm not one for making huge sweeping generalizations, but I do feel confident saying every single thing we do, we do communicate something where you spend your money, how you spend your time. It's communicating what you're prioritizing, the way that I'm showing up to you, the way that I'm listening to you is going to communicate something to you. And so it matters so much, the spaces that we create in our relationships. And it makes so much sense to me that the personal freedom and the collective liberation is intimately interrelated. It is this both and it's not either or they work hand in hand. And so if we have better communication with each other in all the ways that we're showing up, if we create better relationships one-on-one, -on -one, then we can create better social worlds collectively. And I just think that's so beautiful to say and important. So I want to reiterate that piece of communication, which is creating space for each other. Because, you know, when I was on your podcast, I talked about the loop model. And one of those parts of that is untold stories. And so when I think about trying to make untold stories told stories, it's not just, hey, you with the untold story, speak up. It's what kind of space do we need to create intentionally making new choices, making new meaning so that you feel you can speak into this space and make your untold story a told story. So that to me is, you know, intimately related with healing as well. How are we creating spaces that enable healing? It's not just let me fix you and heal you and yeah. offer you solutions. Let me create a space, you know, kind of bringing together what both of you are saying. How can we create a space to let the body, heart, soul do the healing it's going to do anyway, because our bodies know how to do that. Yeah. And I think how this, it's funny, um, Shonda, you brought up the micro and macro. And I used to feel bad about doing the macro because I'm like, I'm not actually helping any single person. All of my shit is like theoretical. And am I just like 
of putting all of my effort into the ether is this doing anything and mm. I think that Venn diagram of like where the micro meets the macro is so important because if from a communications lens I would say collect the journey of collective liberation starts with exactly what you were just sharing Abby which is everyone who's humaning gets to be a participate and share their voice so that when we construct systems and policies and say um hey this isn't working for me we don't view that as you are a threat to the like typical person's way of existence but just that inclusivity like yesterday my husband and I went to Universal Studios in Hollywood um and there's a upper lot and a lower lot and to get from the where you park to the Mario world we had to take like five escalators and walk a lot and I noticed that there were no elevators so I Mm. said how would someone in a wheelchair or crutches like get down and then we were looking around and we asked somebody and they were like, oh, you would have to make special arrangements with the park in advance to like, have Mm -hmm. you driven down? And I'm just wondering like, how many people are doing that? So I'm sure you theoretically could, but do people who don't have the ability to walk a lot and go down um, escalators because their wheelchair or whatever way they walk doesn't fit, Um, do they feel welcome here? And I'm guessing there's a lot of self-selecting out. Mm -hmm. And so the way that, and this isn't even a government, this is just a place to go and have some fun and entertainment. And it seems all happy, nice on the outside with parents, with their children. And I'm sure it's fun for them, but I'm like, would they be willing to listen to someone's story and be like, yeah, I'm a parent with children and I'm in a wheelchair and it's extremely limiting for me to not have this park as an option when my kids really want to go see Harry Potter or whatnot. And I think at the end of the day, like that's what collective liberation is, just not marginalizing someone and saying you don't fit in. Oh, um, thank you for telling us your story. First, as you said, making it a space where someone feels comfortable to even share it, then not reacting of like, well, here's our all of our rationale for why things are the way they are. Mm -hmm. But thank you for telling us, can we co-create something together? Because something I've often heard is like, don't complain unless you're always also going to propose a solution. And I'm like, how is it the marginalized person's fault? Yeah. How, why are they responsible for redesigning this thing? Yeah, yeah. It's, you shouldn't design it without them, but the onus shouldn't all be on them. And so I think the beautiful part of collective liberation is that it's collective healing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's everything Shonda and I said, but applied that love applied on a macro public scale. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah so much of that and um like putting a period there and like going back a paragraph (laughs) in my mind something that came up when we were talking about communication and not just being words is um so much of communication requires a person to be present Mm -hmm. the moment and I I just feel like yeah, I, I want to share that because we one, we miss so much communication. And it's often in my perspective, the lack of presencing that is the root of so much miscommunication and missed communication. Um, because we're somewhere in the past or the future attempting to communicate one of those things and 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 we're not in the present. Mm-hmm. And so before we before this recording, um, my husband and I went for a walk and I took my camera with me. And I didn't necessarily, I didn't go like, I'm going to photograph this, but having my camera brings me more into the present because I want to see if there's something I want to photograph and then I have to look at it and then I have to focus the camera. And it's just, it's this process for me that feels like it's really instrumental in my presencing right now. And I, I was just, you know, if something caught my attention, I took a picture of it. And I didn't have to go through, well, why am I taking a picture? This is interesting. But then I went back and started looking at some of the pictures and like, whoa, 
like I didn't even see this or or that. And it brings me to this concept that I that I've been really sitting with that I just want to share with folks. Uh, I call it 46 minutes. And if you're watching a show on television, that's about an hour. If you stream it, it's about 42 to 46 minutes. And but the re- the the film they have to give us that well put together package, they have hours of filming, right? So in order for that, even for a podcast, like we could talk for a certain amount of time, but like mm-hmm. there's some editing that happens. So if we got to get some some footage down to 46 minutes, please believe there is no fluff. There there's nothing in that episode that the editors and director didn't want in the episode. And it's either Harkening back to a past episode, helping you understand the the present of the character and scenario or forecasting to the future, the settings, the props, like everything has an intention. Because if I only got 46 minutes to communicate something, then I'm going to be very intentional about what I'm putting in there. And so I started viewing life as 46 minutes. I think, is it 86,400 seconds in a day? I think it's 86,400. I calculate this at some point. No, but it's a lot of seconds in a day. And so when I get to a point in the day and I remember seeing something, for me, that's a 46 46 minute moment. There's too much to see. There's too much to hear. There's too much to smell. Like we are, our senses, right? So if I can recall something, I was meant to see it. And and what that has done for me is it has allowed me to trust that the setting is set, right? I don't really have to go looking for a whole bunch of stuff. I just need to be present to mm-hmm. what is. And because of that, I've become so much more in tune to the communication of nature. I live in a suburb, so it's not like I'm out here hiking or doing like it, yeah. the nature I have access to communicates all the time, right? And Hetty and I did an episode where we talked about the seasons. We were talking about spring. And by the time we say spring is here, spring has already begun and what it communicates. And so because communication is what we're talking about, I just really felt like I wanted to encourage folks, like if you can just be present in the moment, right? There's the, the improvement in quality of communication. I feel like that's the majority of the work, right? Of Ooh. just being present to what is. And when we recognize that part of our brain's job is to make up a story about what is, that just gives us the opportunity to pause within that story. Most people would hate watching TV with me. I pause a lot. Like I, I try not to, I'll just go with it if I'm with other people, but people who are close to me, one, they know I need to have the remote. And we know that we barely get past like the opening credits and I'm like pausing and being like, da, 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 da. So imagine Marvel movies that are already three hours long. Like it's really ridiculous with me because I'm pausing because like we move past that way too fast. Like there, Mm -hmm. there was something there. Like I'm curious about this. And so curiosity and being present for me are two huge functions of communication. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, the brain is going to give you a story, likely in the form of a judgment. And once we recognize that we can recognize that the story has been given, but we don't have to accept it, that we yeah. can pause in that moment and get curious about it, thank our brain for functioning in that way, but going, I don't actually have to stick to this story. For me, that's 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 so much freedom. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I just discovered another thing that you and I do. I pause <laughs> a lot. Um, and I also pause because my husband has such a great sense of humor. And he often um, catches those little things in the scene or in the back. And I'm like too invested in the drama of like the main plot. Thing. And so when I hear him laugh, I pause and go, wait, what just made you laugh? Because that was not funny. And he's like, <laughs> do you see like that extra in the back, their facial expression? <laughs> and it's like all blurry. And I'm like, I love that he's so present and like scanning the environment. And I'm, I one of the things I love being married, uh, 
about being married to him is like life is just a lot more funnier like i did not laugh as same things would happen and i wouldn't find them funny because i was on like a single story track and then mm -hmm. being with him i'm like oh yeah like this is really sad or it's really mundane and like there's this greater absurdist humor going on um and so, and that doesn't mean I have to change my story. I just have to notice it. And for me, that helps to be like really present, you know, to be like, oh, whoa, that's also going on. And then to feel myself laugh, to feel the vibrations, like it just makes me feel more alive. And I think that's been super helpful to my journey. Yeah, that that's great. And speaking of pausing, we're going to have to pause here. And I'm, you know, surprised. And not surprised that the time has flown by so quickly because I assumed it would with the both of you. But I am going to call this a pause and, you know, trust that what we've said in this time has been meaningful and also recognize that it exists in a larger context that if people don't want to be done hearing from you, you've got a podcast and a lot of great, you know, content out there that people can interact with and just keep hearing more and hopefully, yeah, continuing to heal and find their own meaning making and tell new stories. As we wrap up, you know, I have this language that I like to use around better social world. So I just want to give you a chance using that language to give us a short little recap of maybe what we talked about today to say all of this, how is this part of moving us toward a better social world? Maybe a slightly different question of that is what is that social world that we're moving towards? So again, I know this is a big question I'm asking us to wrap up on this, but just thinking about the conversation we've had today, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how all of this relates to the kind of better social world you hope that we can build together. That's such a good question. I mean, for me, I'm just going to simply say a better social world is one where um, all of us are valued mm -hmm. and we're given um, a space, that container that we talked about where we can play and practice with authenticity um, and be completely free. I feel like so much of society has been constructed to um, bond people and um, put them on very like narrow tracks of what it means to be live, living as a fully self-actualized human mm. um, when actually the definitions of what it means to be self-actualized in at least the American version that I'm aware of is actually quite immature and quite lacking of what is even possible. And I'm still exploring the limits of that. And so that's what a better social world means to me. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful question. And I think most concise way that I can say it is I see a better social world where we can be the beings we were intended to be and not the doings that mm. structures and systems have convinced us to find us. Mm -hmm. I am both radical and naive enough to believe that that world can be possible. Um, even if it means some individuals creating that world for themselves and then that spreading out. Um, and I think a better social world is one where we have to re, like, I don't want people to work. On, on my walk, yep. I watched these trees and grass and a pond and none of it was working hard. All of it was just being. Mm -hmm. And so a better social world is where we get to be. And when we are being in community, the inherent ways of collective need meeting and collective joy and collective grief and all the things don't become a job that someone has a title for and you need insurance to get it. Mm -hmm. It's a better social world where we get to be together and because I love you and because you love me and like Hedy said, we are valued, then I will, in my essence, do the things that help you survive and feel valued and you will do the things within your essence that help me survive and feel valued. And that that's a beautiful world that, like I said, I am both naive and radical enough mm -hmm. to envision. 
Wow. Well, thank you both so much. I've so enjoyed speaking with you again, and I'm just really grateful for your perspectives and your time today. Thank you both. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you, Abby. Okay, that is all for our conversation with Hetty and Shonda. At the end of each episode, I like to offer questions to reflect on, which act as a next turn so the conversation doesn't stop just because the episode does. Today, two questions I would have you think about are, what are you creating in your relationships? And what does healing mean to you, both individually and collectively? I think those are two important things to reflect on as we walk away from this conversation and you have the context of all that Hetty and Shonda shared to get you started doing that reflection. You are welcome to reach out to me to share your reflections as well as any of your own questions or ideas. You can do that through email, the website, or by commenting on Instagram, YouTube, or the CMM Institute Substack where you can find this podcast. Links to all those places are in the show notes. And I want to share the reason I invite you to share your reflections with me is to stay in dialogue. Other great ways to keep dialogue going is to follow the show wherever you listen, leave a rating and review, share this episode with someone you want to invite into the conversation, and especially filling out that survey I mentioned at the top of the episode to help me make this podcast into something meaningful for all of us. I'm supported by the CMM Institute for Personal and Social Evolution. This podcast is just one of many initiatives designed to help us in our journey of creating better social worlds through better communication. Another initiative that I want to highlight at this time is Cosmo Parenting. This is an upcoming initiative. It'll be a podcast beginning in January of 2025. This is the continuation of our Cosmo activities, which are social emotional resources that are all available for free. You can find those at www.cosmoactivities.com. And you can find Cosmo Parenting at the Cosmo Parenting Substack. I've included that link in the show notes here as well. So if you are someone who is parenting, I definitely encourage you to go ahead, head over there and subscribe so that you can get those episodes right in your inbox when they start coming out in January. So definitely check that out and check out the other initiatives of the CMM Institute. Links to all of them are in the show notes. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being curious and thank you for being a part of this story. I'm Abby and this has been Stories Lived, Stories Told. Mm-hmm.